Hello everybody and welcome to our first recorded lecture in the class Zionism and its Critics. Today's class, like all the other recorded lectures, will be accompanied by a handout, so I really recommend using this as sort of the skeleton or the outline of our lecture. And today's topic is pretty much setting the stage for the rest of the class is Zionism in a European context and Zionism in a modern Jewish context. It follows uh, uh, naturally from some of the discussions we had in our introductory uh, lecture, in which I've argued that there are several multiple contexts or trajectories in which one can read the emergence of Jewish nationalism. Uh, and uh, within these three Venn diagrams uh, that include 20th century Middle Eastern history, modern Jewish history, and the history of European nationalism, today's lecture will focus on the latter two, on the place, uh, it, uh, the, the meeting point, uh, or the overlap between modern Jewish history and the history of modern uh, nationalism. So, in order to uh, start our uh, discussion and provide us with some key words uh, that would provide the vocabulary to the rest of our class and also will appear in so many of your discussion, I would like to subdivide our discussion today according to the uh, conceptual map I offer here before you, uh, focusing on five keywords or five central concepts that will appear time and again in our discussion. Emancipation, Haskalah, or Jewish Enlightenment, if you'd like, assimilation, and fourth, Romanticism, fifth, anti-Semitism. And I will try to speak uh, in greater length about the former three, but I will touch briefly on the latter two and the very uh, dialectic tension between these uh, different concepts. So let's start our right off by discussing what is Jewish emancipation. Now, we tend uh, to use the word uh, to emancipate interchangeably with the verb to free someone. Uh, emancipare comes from Latin. It's a term that was employed in the ancient Roman law, and that was the action or process of setting children free from the uh, uh, protection of their parents. Uh, so if you'd like, emancipate in the ancient Roman concept was about making someone independent. And the term itself, I assume, would sound familiar to many of you, even if you had never studied modern Jewish history, because we talk about the emancipation of slaves, for instance, or those of you who read Russian history will remember the lengthy discussion about the emancipation of the serfs by the Tsar in the 19th century. So this is a term that had been applied to many other instances uh, abolition of slaves, liberation of serfs, equalization of workers um, and women, um, the release from persecution or disabilities, of adherence of, um, um, of dissenting rel uh, religions. So if you would like in, um, um, in a, an academic term, what we have here is a polysemous term, meaning it's a term that has many different meanings. Polysemy is that capacity of a word or a phrase to have more than one meaning, multiple poly meanings and related to different uh, contexts. So it should be mentioned that when we talk about Jewish uh, emancipation, uh, we would probably be best, uh, uh, we will probably define it in the best way if you will uh, 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 describe it in the following uh, way. Uh, the removal of discriminatory laws and regulations allowing the inclusion, elevation, and equalization of Jews as members of a distinct religious uh, group. Now, I mentioned this uh, basic or working uh, definition because it would allow us to understand that emancipation as a modern process that to, uh, um, um, uh, took place um, predominantly in Europe, but not only there, included two dimensions or two type of rights, civil and political rights. Civil rights comprise of residence and occupation. Uh, it also had to do with property ownership, who can 
own land and buildings, freedom of worship, as well as serving as a witness in court, swearing an oath or having juridical standing to bring a lawsuit. Now, political rights on the other hand, denoted appointment to the civil service, holding an elected office, and exercising the franchise, meaning voting. And in a way, when Jews were emancipated, they gained this bundle of rights that includes these two dimensions or two kinds of, of rights. But it is a very modern uh, process that should be distinguished, and historians do offer a clear divide between the type of privileges that sometimes uh, individual Jews or small groups would receive in corporate societies and the type of rights uh, Jews gained in a civil society. What do I mean by that? Again, the slide before you try to summarize it. In a corporate society, or sometimes what historians would call an estate society, you can privilege one group uh, um, in specific. It's group-specific privileges. Group could held specific privileges through legislated uh, charters that granted them a defined legal status, for example. Um, nobles or priests or bourgeois. Um, and for example, from the 16th to the 18th centuries, uh, some cities or polities had enacted uh, what is called jury laws that imposed an inferior legal status relegating Jews to the margins of that corporate uh, society and saw them as a different group. They differentiated them according to their ascribed utility to that polity. And some provident, prominent uh, individuals, often referred to as court Jews, could gain extensive privileges. They will be singled out from their entire estate. Now, this is a, a, a pre-modern, or some would argue early modern practice you can find in many European societies that organize themselves in a corporate hierarchical order, which is very different from what we find in contrast in, after the American and the French revolutions that introduced universal rights and predicted on the liberty and equality of the individual. This is a model of civil society that emerged when these group-specific privileges or hierarchies were moved uh, aside, when gave way to a uniform or universal concept of rights that guaranteed individual equality. Now, to clarify, this is a very neat model. Historians will show automatically that reality was more murky. There was no clear-cut transition. And there are odd cases that we would not go into in which you had a dualism of, if you'd like, local level or municipal level type of citizenship uh, versus state level citizenship right in german um, in the german uh, language you have this duality um, um, uh, when you're talking about the heimach Heimatrecht, the law of the Heimat or the city, uh, versus the level of the Stadtburgenschaft, uh, uh, which is kind of the, the citizenship of a state. We would not go into these uh, hair-splitting distinctions, uh, and we will stick to the model, um, uh, but this is a caveat that is important to mention. Now, if you look at the traditional periodization, meaning the way in which traditionally historians would provide a chronology of the Jewish emancipation, you can see that it's not only a very European uh, phenomenon, it's even a very German uh, um, 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 innovation. It originated, uh, most uh, historians will look at uh, Christian Dom's uh, very famous uh, 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 pamphlet concerning the uh, amelioration of the civil status of the Jews from 1781 as sort of uh, the first uh, signpost or landmark event that shows, paved the way to a future inclusion of the, uh, of the Jews in uh, the society in the uh, surrounding hosting society, and it was followed by a series of other legislation, edicts, and and so on by other rulers fra such as Franz jo Joseph II, the uh, that uh, issued a tablet of tolerance. Um, and so on, continuing from the uh, late uh, 18th century, from 1781, all the way up 
to the 1920s. Uh, it's a very long and slow uh, process uh, in which you, you can see it spreading um, 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 to other lands with uh, emancipation entering uh, Eastern lands in a much uh, slower pace. So in our, um, um, if you will take this chronology or periodization and put it if you'd like on a map you automatically see how much emancipation was not a linear process but one that if you'd like created intra jewish differences that map on regional differences one clear difference that one automatically sees is on the east versus west axis. You can see automatically how in Russia, for instance, in most of the Eastern uh, European lands, emancipation came very late in the game. Uh, but if you look carefully, you can also see differences on the vertical axis between south and north. Um, I would leave it uh, uh, at here. Uh, but it's a, uh, uh, I would only hint at this stage that later on when we will talk about the way in which the first Zionist leaders were looking at European Jewry and were talking about the big difference between what they called the Ostjuden, the Jews of Eastern Europe, and the West Juden, the Jews of West uh, um, Europe, much of what they had in mind is exactly this uh, um, difference between uh, the Western, predominantly German-speaking Jews that already enjoyed civil rights and started uh, integrating into their hosting societies and the Jews of the Pale of uh, Settlement. A landmark event in that respect that could not be underestimated is, of course, the French Revolution. And even more than that, uh, the way in which in 1806, uh, uh, you, uh, Napoleon Bonaparte uh, emancipated the Jews formally. Here you can see a print from that year that describes it with all the pathos of the uh, era. We will uh, perhaps return briefly to Napoleon Bonaparte also in later um, discussions because uh, Jews had a very interesting, if you like, complicated relationship with the idea of the Napoleonic uh, state and also because Napoleon himself will launch a very uh, a big military campaign trying to conquer the eastern shores of the Mediterranean, famously uh, 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 advancing from Egypt into what we would call uh, the area of Palestine Israel today, uh, stopping at the famous uh, siege on Akko, Acre, that he never succeeded. During that famous Egyptian campaign, uh, Napoleon would try to uh, encourage the Jews to support his project and will issue a declaration that in a way uh, uh, resembles, if you'd like, uh, one can call it like the first Balfour Declaration, um, in which he called, invited all the Jews of Asia and Africa to gather, gather under the flag in order to establish, uh, re-establish uh, a polity in ancient Jerusalem. It's very interesting to see how much we forget about the Napoleonic Declaration uh, uh, um, um, and much of it had to do with the fact that at the time he was issuing it, there was no Zionist organization or a movement that will pick up and deliver on that uh, promise. Uh, um, this is only one of the reasons among these many. So emancipation is a complicated term. Uh, I cannot go into great detail. I would strongly recommend picking up uh, David Sorkin's latest book on Jewish emancipation, A History Across Five Centuries, that shows you uh, the nuances and also provides a portrait of emancipation as part of a much longer history and also part of a larger history of citizenship that is not only centered on Europe. So you can uh, um, say or blame me for offering uh, us the traditional, maybe perhaps even slightly passé, Eurocentric uh, um, 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 overview of what is Jewish emancipation. But I would leave it at here. And of course, we can uh, um, uh, return to that in, in later discussion. I will move now to our second uh, concept, which is related but is definitely not synonymous, which is Haskalah. Haskalah 
is the Hebrew word from, for being erudite or literate. Or uh, so to this day, if you will call someone a maskil, it means that he's well read and well educated. But the term haskalah is a concept that is uh, a historical one. It's simply the Hebrew equivalent of what we will call we will call in other uh, languages enlightenment. In French, we have the lumière, um, um, and in, in German, we have the Aufklärung. Uh, so the Jews started uh, the, uh, calling the same process using that word uh, Haskalah. So the clearest and kind of a textbook definition for Haskalah would be to define it as intellectual movement among European Jews. And once again, predominantly first central European German speaking Jews and only later on in other parts of Europe. And that they advocated adopting Enlightenment values, pressing for better integration of Jews into their hosting European environments, and increasing education of the Jews themselves in secular studies, Hebrew language, and Jewish history. And I started the discussion on Haskalah using this poster or image because I think it illustrates a lot of the pathos of the Haskalah. What you can see in front of you is a, uh, uh, an image that was produced in October 1763 uh, when the King of Prussia granted one Jewish philosopher, a very famous one, Moses Mendelssohn, the privilege of a protected Jew. And, and that happened after Mendelssohn won a very important competition, the Berlin Academy's uh, competition, uh, in which uh, different scholars were asked to complete, to submit an essay, um, um, and, uh, and um, Mendelssohn won the gold medal. His essay was about the application of mathematical proofs to metaphysics. Um, and uh, by the way, Immanuel Kant, the, the most famous German philosopher of the time, was also competing with him and he uh, came second in that uh, uh, famous competition. And the poster provides you kind of uh, the image and also the pathos of, 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 of um, uh, Jewish Enlightenment and also the image of Moses Mendelssohn. You can see him, his profile side by side next to Socrates, no other than that, kind of an image of a trans uh, temporal, tra transgenerational discussion or dialogue between the ancient Greek philosopher and the modern Jewish uh, philosopher. But you can also, if you pay attention to the iconography as a whole, you can also see that there's a tip picks up very classic European Christian motives in it. Above them, you can see the pigeon that often is the symbol of the Holy Ghost, not a very Jewish symbol to begin with. And beneath, you can see the skull, with kind of the classic Renaissance style memento mori, remember at the end of the day, we're all dead, which is also a almost classical way of uh, uh, of depicting uh, the uh, the way in which knowledge would not prevent us uh, uh, um, move us beyond mortality, but at the same time, what we produce as scholars would will live after us. So I think that this is a poster that kind of in a in a uh, um, uh, in many so many words captures much of the spirit of the Haskalah. But even if we'll go back to kind of those three big pillars of uh, the uh, Jewish Haskalah that I've mentioned earlier, you can see how much complicated Haskalah was. It was far beyond simply a Jewish imitation of uh, European Enlightenment um, uh, um, 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 learnings. Um, when adopting, when calling, when Haskalah scholars and, and advocates were calling on Jews to adopt in Enlightenment values, it opened up the this idea of a dialogue uh, uh, um, across uh, um, across the bound with the hosting society and culture and intellectual achievements uh, were seen as as requiring this type of a close conversation, especially in the German speaking lands. And again, Moses Mendelssohn is uh, this prototypical example. There was a very strong influence, therefore, of specifically the German Enlightenment, the Aufklärung. And 
it means that not once you can see in some of the discussions of Jewish uh, thinkers that emerge from German speaking uh, background that they will adopt um, uh, types of German idealist language uh, into their language. So, for instance, in German uh, late Enlightenment and later on also the Romanticism, there will be a very clear distinction, for instance, between Kultur and Zivilisation. Civil, what we call in English, we have only one word, civilization, that includes both the spiritual, if you'd like, achievement and the technical one. For the Germans, it was a very clear that civil, civilization is something that uh, denotes the technological uh, advances, uh, but culture is sort of an idealist uh, spiritual advancement, and it will be something that the Germans will, will push uh, to a degree. Often they will say that their foes, their competitors in Europe, the French and the British, maybe have civilization, they have advanced ships and arms and, and sophisticated industries and technologies, but they lack the Kultur the, uh, that the German culture has. And also the concept that is so difficult to translate, the concept of Bildung in Germany, that refers both to education and self-improvement. A real an, um, a man of the Haskalah and the Enlightenment is someone who is not simply learner, but through this learning he improves on his um, uh, own um, character and becomes a new type of citizen, a conscious citizen uh, in the world. And it also had a very complicated dialogue with traditional religion and we'll, uh, we will not be able to go into detail here and discuss how enlightenment, uh, some enlightenment uh, thinkers developed uh, ideas about the deism or universal religion um, uh, and how Jewish uh, um, masculine that were in dialogue with them were influenced by some of these ideas. Uh, by pressing for a better uh, integration into the uh, European society, the proponents or the advocates of the Ascala were pushing forward the idea of a formal civil equality, but stressing at the same time that it's uh, not enough to only think about a legal statue. You need to, to create it, uh, a new type of an identity, and often people will argue that the, it was due to the influence of the Haskalah that you had a creation of these type of hyphenated identities among Jews that is very interesting in the context of our discussion uh, in the age of rising nationalism. Suddenly, the emancipated and well-educated Jews started calling themselves German Jew, French Jew, or if you like, in Germany of the 19th century, German of the Mosaic faith and so on. You are in your civil and civic and identity a member of the German new state uh, and it's only a matter, matter of a faith or a religion that uh, uh, still ties you with uh, with Judaism. Uh, again, we will not be able to open up the big discussion about when did even Jews started thinking about Judaism as a religion in a very narrow modern sense, as something that could be separated from, uh, uh, from the state. Some scholars will argue that in itself you know, uh, that's a modern um, phenomenon and a, a fantastic book that uh, uh, encapsulates it in its title is uh, poses the question, when did Judaism become a uh, religion? Um, it opened up also very important questions about acculturation or assimilation that we will go uh, we will discuss in, in, in a few minutes, uh, how, what does it mean to integrate into a hosting society? Are you imitating your non-Jewish neighbors? Are you following some of their mores and manners while you need to keep others um, uh, um, the same? Uh, it opens up new type of questions that pre-emancipatory and pre escala Jews were not that bothered with. And the first Pillar, education and the call to increase education uh, among Jews was often a call to increase what we would call today secular studies. Uh, but also Haskalah often uh, uh, was the one to 
introduced the idea of Hebrew language, not uh, the study of a Hebrew language of a, as a language of a sacred script and only a language for prayer, but something which is historical uh, and it's connected to education also of Jewish uh, um, history. The idea of Jewish self-improvement is also tied to the origins of the reform movement and also you have especially in the early 19th century a very important intellectual movement that is calling itself the Wissenschaft de Judaismus, which is uh, literally the science of Judaism, which is an attempt of, uh, of a German Jewish scholars to, in, to apply what they consider to be a scientific investigation of the Hebrew sources and the Jewish history to be much more critical of the ritual uh, and the hymnology and in applying their way on Judaism the thing that critical uh, modern biblical science applied on the New Testament uh, uh, and so on. So it opened up a, qu a question that scholars of the 18th century and the 19th century are very uh, uh, busy discussing with no one clear answer about whether this signified also a transition from, if you'd like, Judaism to Jewishness, meaning from type of uh, Ju uh, conception of one's self as Jew as belonging to a religious group to Jewishness as some sort of a different type of identity and the critics of uh, Haskalah would offer would often uh, argue or present what often would be a, a caricature of Haskalah it led ultimately to conversion and uh, 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 living out the Jewish fold. Now to, to clarify once again there is a caveat here or if you'd like a historiographic problem because our understanding of the Haskalah once again the way it presented it here is a very Germanocentric way of understanding it. Um, it was often seen as something that emerged from Moses Mendelssohn and his peers and disciples and only then uh, in a second wave or a second phase uh, spilled out to other uh, areas. Those of you who are familiar with Jacob Katz's very famous book on uh, entitled From Ghetto to Emancipation can see a clear example of that. And nowadays historians are more cautious. They no longer narrate the story of modern Jewish history as there is only as if there was only one single path to modernity, which is the German one. But nevertheless, uh, it's a good model or at least a start of, of point to discuss it. In front of you, you can see another image, I think, that captures again a very essential way about the way in which the Haskalah imagined itself or more accurately was perceived uh, um, in the mid 19th century. This is a painting uh, done by a, 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 a German painter by the name of Moritz Daniel Oppenheim in 1856, long after Mendelssohn was already uh, gone and passed. And it depicts here the philosopher Moses Mendelssohn, the theologian Johann Kasper Laffeter, playing chess. And they were playing chess in the home of a third important Enlightenment thinker, Gotthold Ephraim Lessing. Mendelssohn is the fellow depicted on the left, uh, wearing a red coat and a scallop. He's seated at a chess table, if you can, uh, uh, you can see uh, um, uh, next to Laffeter that he's leaning forward. Now, this is a painting that is often used in this illustration, but actually it's rich in symbolism. It's not so much an accurate depiction of an actual event as much as a, a, a prototypical or imaginary way in which the painter thought about the important dialogue these two thinkers and theologians had at the time. Now, why am I mentioning the symbolism? Think about the meaning of putting at the center of, uh, of the table a chess game. Why a chess? Chess is a game of rationality. It's universal laws. It's about merits. The one to win in the game is the one that has the superior brain power. It's not about one's ethnicity, background, and, um, and so on. The chess game is put here side by side as an, e and an equal footing with the... Uh, uh, with the open book uh, of probably the Old Testament that both of them, uh, the 
a Jewish theologian and a Christian theologian are trying to uh, uh, to interpret in different ways. So, um, uh, you can see that Lessing, the standing gentleman hovering above them, at the center of the of the uh, of the painting, is is a bit of a referee of sort overlooking this. Uh, you could probably uh, uh, agree with me that this is a very male bourgeois environment, right? We have at the side uh, either a wife or a woman servant that is holding the tray in entertaining the men. But if you would look carefully, and unfortunately we'll have to do it by going and finding a, 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 the image online in a better quality, but you will have to re, re, uh, uh, trust me that under the door, uh, surmounted by uh, an inscription drawn from Hebrew blessing, it actually says there in Hebrew script, Baruch ata bevoacha ve Baruch ata betzetcha. Blessed shall thou be when thou comes in, and blessed shall thou be when thou goes out. This comes from Deuteronomy 28. Six. So you can see here this uh, uh, is a, a scripture of invitation that, if you'd like, symbolically is an invitation for a dialogue or a conversation. Um, and behind them, on the back of the wall, and left of the scene, there's even the image of uh, hangs a Mizrach. Mizrach literally in Hebrew means east. This is a plate indicating the direction facing uh, east. That's the direction that the Jew would prayer to. So it means for a viewer from the 19th century that Mendelssohn is still an observant Jew that after this conversation and chess game will be over will still pray and heading towards the east heading to, uh, um, to Jerusalem. So a painting like this refers to uh, both a key moment in the uh, in the actual history of the Haskalah, actually two moments in which there was uh, several real-life meetings between Mendelssohn and Lafater, which took place in 1763 and 64. Uh, but it's more than that, it's a symbol about the way in which a Jewish philosopher found himself in the middle of uh, this uh, European Enlightenment conversation. But the depiction of this specific encounter with Lafater is important. Um, the La what came to be known as the Lafater affair was actually the failed attempt on behalf of the Christian theologian um, uh, Lafater to convince Moses Mendelssohn to convert to Christianity, to leave uh, Judaism and embraced Christianity as the religion of the universal law. The The fact that uh, in that affair um, Mendelssohn came with good reasons why not to leave Judaism became a much uh, celebrated occasion um, and the idea that they remain comrades or friends despite that also shows, uh, shows that um, and it also hints of the very close relationship between Mendelssohn and and Lessing, uh, which uh, in a way became a paradigm of a harmonious cohabitation between Germans and, and Jews. Um, uh, one last image of the Haskalah that, that is important in that respect uh, is this portrait of, of Moses Mendelssohn, ver versions of which were uh, reprinted and reproduced in many other places and occasions. This is a slide I like to call In Your Face. And why is that an important portrait? Not because uh, necessarily Moses Mendelssohn was the ha most handsome man on earth, because there's something which is very clear for a 19th century viewer of such a painting, and that is the fact that Moses Mendelssohn is almost uh, clean-shaven. Why is that a big deal? So we not. I, uh, I won't go into detail, but as probably as many of you know, Judaism prohibits shaving with a razor on the basis of a rabbinic interpretation of one of the passages uh, of the Old Testament, which st states that you shall not go round off the side growth of your beard. And there's a debate, there was a debate among rabbis how to exactly interpret this. Uh, shaving is prohibited, uh, pro probably most will say, only with the use of a razor, 
tal in Hebrew, uh, cream, scissors, etc., were halachically uh, okay, and there was no explicit command to actually grow a beard. In the late 18th century, actually, if you look at noblemen, especially Portuguese and Italian Jews, that were wealthy and wanted to show off their wealth, they would be all uh, clean shaven. Mendelssohn uh, was often depicted as clean shaven, meaning that he looks European, often, if you like, non uh, non Jew. In in bad quality depictions of this uh, of this uh, uh, of this portrait, people could not see something that I hope you can see if you look carefully at the slide, and that is act, and that's the fact that he's actually wear, does wear a beard. This is what we would call today curtain beard, or sometimes people call it Shenandoah beard, or a so-called Amish beard, meaning it's only a beard beneath uh, uh, um, his uh, 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 his face uh, in in bad depiction it would look like a shade and people thought that he was not wearing a beard at all and I mention it because it's a key moment in the um, in the debates between the Haskalah and its opponent a key moment of the birth of modern Orthodox Judaism for instance was when growing a beard became a conscious way uh, and and an an order on the Jews to distinguish themselves from the surrounding in environment and I would mention it and I would stress this as an, a historian this is a modern phenomenon it's a modern orthodox reaction to modernity in general and the challenge of Haskalah in particular that says there's no problem to be uh, uh, um, a clean shave and, and, and engage in a dialogue with your surrounding uh, so modern orthodox modern ultra orthodoxy started with uh, thinkers like Hatam Sofer in Hungary and others, and they started thinking about how to set the Jews apart from their host society and help uh, uh, rather than help them to mingle uh, with it. And wearing a beard became suddenly uh, a very clear sign of a distinction. Again, those of you who would like to read more about it, I would recommend picking up Michael Silber's wonderful studies of Hungarian Judaism. So these are very German developments, and of course, I would only hint here that if you would look at the map of Europe and just slide it eastwards toward the Russian Empire, you will see a radically different environment and a political situation there. At the turn of the 20th century, you will see that 60% of Europe Jews, that was roughly 5.2 million out of 8.7 million Jews at the end of the 19th century, lived actually in the Russian Empire, where they did not enjoy neither emancipation nor much Haskalah. In East Europe, you will start seeing maskilim, meaning proponents of the Haskalah, that would follow the ideas of the German maskilim in uh, in a, with a sort of a, as latecomers in uh, um, in a way, but it's important to remember this, and this is a vast, vast area. It includes uh, uh, multiple provinces that uh, would map on what we would call today uh, roughly Western Ukraine, Belarus, Lithuania, uh, some of Poland, uh, um, and 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 these are this is uh, an environment we will return to later on. Um, a key feature of the Haskalah was the creation of new magazines, periodicals, and newspapers. And in front of you, we can uh, see a slide, an example of one of the most famous among them, Hashachar, literally The Dawn, which was a Hebrew monthly published by Peretz Molanskin between the years 1868 to 1880. Uh, five in Vienna. This is an Peretz Molanskin, who is a figure we will return to, is one of those exa uh, one of the examples of a uh, East European Russian speaking uh, maskil that came much later than the uh, Mendelssohn and his peers in in Germany and started his career admiring uh, uh, Mendelssohn but then moved on uh, to a different uh, direction and you can see uh, uh, and we will talk about it in later discussion now Smolanskin founded his new newspaper or magazine exactly in order to spread the ideas of the Enlightenment among the Jews, especially the Jews of Eastern Europe. 
Now, Smolanskin, who was also the editor, published in it articles calling, for instance, for the uh, dissemination of the Hebrew language, uh, and also later on, nationalist ideas and the return to Zion. For him, there was almost a direct uh, flow from Enlightenment ideas to things that we would call today proto-Zionist ideas, and it even gave rise to radical and social ideas at the time. He criticized the rabbis and the religious Judaism, the religious establishment, which he characterized um, um, uh, as, 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 as symbols of stagnation and ignorance. Um, on the other hand, he also uh, criticized the two educated Jews that were called for complete and full assimilation into the Russian Empire, uh, in which uh, Jews will rid themselves of any particularistic um, 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 characters. So I am mentioning these uh, because it shows you slightly the difference between the East European and the, uh, and the Central European German speaking uh, Nascala. And also to remind you how important these journals are, among the authors of the journals were really the heavyweights of East European Haskala, thinkers such as Yehuda Leib Gordon, Moshe Leib Lillenboim, Yehuda Leib uh, uh, Levin, we, which we call La Yahalal, um, and even Eliezer Ben Yehuda, a figure we will return to, uh, published his first article there in the late 19th century, in 1879, uh, called She'ela Nichvada, a grave question that dealt with revival of Jewish nationalism. If you paid close attention even to the name of the journal Hashachar de Don, you could already see this kind of enlightenment pathos in so many European languages. Uh, the notion or the metaphor of light or dawn, uh, sun rays is, is included and in a way the name he gave to his uh, journal is there. And also look at the uh, type of motto uh, that uh, he was chosen here. Uh, it was a motto taken from the book of Isaiah. Uh, then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. I, so I mention it exactly because it, it opens up the discussion to, to what degree this is a completely secular enlightened idea. It definitely um, uh, pays homage to European enlightenment ideas by uh, using the metaphor of the light, but at the same time makes it very clear that his motto takes us back to the Bible uh, itself. Another famous example of a journal is Hamelitz. This is the oldest Hebrew newspaper the, in Russia. It was founded by Alexander Zaderbaum in Odessa, a city we will mention several times in our class, in 1860. It started as a weekly, then it transformed uh, to St. Petersburg after 1871. And Melit is a very word, uh, a very interesting Hebrew word that's not very frequently used in modern Hebrew that has a dual meaning. Someone who is Hamelit is a well spoken, clearly articulated uh, uh, person, meaning this is an educated and eloquent uh, a human being that can speak well. He knows the art. Of rhetoric, if you'd like. But it also has a second meaning. The Melitz is an advocate, is someone who is an intercessor. It's also, a, this is the meaning of the word also in, in, in the Bible. Sometimes it's like a translator or interpreter that helps commu uh, creating the, the dialogue or the communication between two different groups that have different languages. So think about these dual meanings when thinking about what the editors of Hamelitz saw as the uh, as the aim of the of the journal itself. Hamelitz saw itself as a representative of the progressive or Hakskala uh, movement, um, um, and at the same time, it was also explaining the uh, policies of the Russian. Uh, um, regime to the Jews and vice versa, representing the idea of the Jews in front, uh, in the face of the Russian um, 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 uh, authorities. Um, so um, 
um, it was uh, again one of those examples of uh, of a, a classic late Enlightenment or East European Enlightenment journals uh, that provided a forum for very important uh, publications. One of the most famous examples of that pathos of the East European Haskalah can be found in the writings of Yehuda Leib Golden. And especially uh, illuminating in that respect is one of the poems I recommended reading, an 1866 piece called Awake My People. It was published in a Hebrew language magazine called Hakarmel. And Gordon was a very uh, a vocal uh, proponent of the Haskalah in the Eastern European Russian speaking um, world. And I would not read the entire poem in front of you. You can read it uh, um, at home. I will just read from the opening stanza so you see and feel the pathos of uh, the East European Haskalah. Awake, my people, how long will you sleep? The night has passed, the sun shines through. Awake. Cast your eyes hither and yon. Recognize your time and place. I'll pause it here. Look at how he uses the metaphor of slumber, right? That is connected to his vision of the Enlightenment as something that calls you to wake up and see the light. Those who are, uh, are asleep are the ones that do not, do not wish to know. And those of you who are familiar with Immanuel Kant's famous uh, um, phrase, sapre aude, meaning there to know, uh, that was the way in which he defined the Enlightenment in a very famous essay. This is almost a reference or an echo of those ideas. So in Gordon's poems, gives this kind of a uh, give you almost an order. You, everyone should be capable of learning and they should study. And if you look very quickly at the last answer, again, you return to this idea of you should uh, come awake. The night has passed. The sun shines through. Awake. Cast your eyes. Hither and yon. Recognize your time and place. You can see part of this path is. Let us connected very quickly to some of the, 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 the ideals we had in our previous discussion in which I offered you a typology of different types of, um, of approaches to the study of nationalism. And this, I hope, will explain to you why I'm focusing so much on poets, on magazines and journals. And so quickly... I, we talked in our previous discussions about the differences between primordialism and perennialism, and we, slide, we talked uh, about the modernist school in the study of uh, nationalism. I would like to say a few words today about another very influential theory that belongs um, to the modernist school uh, in our previous typology it equally fits there which is the one proposed by the British scholar Benedict Anderson who explained the cultural roots of nations in a very influential book that came out uh, for the first time in 1983 and then further developed in 1991 with an expanded new edition in which it uh, he argued that the best way to understand the emergence of nations is to see them as imagined communities. And this phrase, imagined communities, became almost a buzzword. So what exactly was Benedict Anderson's idea and how is it connected to our discussion? Now, I would not be able to summarize his entire thesis here. I will do no justice to it. I will just highlight a few the key points that are relevant for our discussion. For Benedict Anderson, a feature of modernity, if not its major engine, is a transition, if you'd like, from what he calls in a classical order to a vernacular language, um, and from there, if you'd like, to a nation's. The roots of nations can be traced back for him to the rise of what we call print capitalism in the 16th century. Uh, prior to the 1500s, um, four out of every Every five books printed were uh, in the classical language of Latin. Only a very few learned men, predominantly priests, were the ones able to pick them up and uh, uh, read them. But in the way 
wake of the Gutenberg uh, um, revolution with the printing press, we also have uh, the rise of the vernacular national languages. You have much more books. 200, 100 million books were produced in the next 100 years as the book became suddenly the first mass-produced industrial commodity. But even more uh, the, uh, important is the success of the book was dwarfed by the rise of the newspaper, the one-day bestseller, as Benedict uh, Anderson calls it. The newspaper created an extraordinary mass uh, uh, a ceremony of a newly rising mercantile class, a stimulus consumption of news. And the newspapers were written in this language, a vernacular language, that only those the, uh, of their language field could understand. They were the embryo of that imagined communities. The community that reads these newspapers uh, would start thinking about itself as a, a community. Now, what is interesting about Anderson's thesis, among other things, is that he thinks about this interaction between capitalism and print culture as a clear uh, engine that changes us and creates the need for people to think that they are part of a community that you can not see face to face, uh, but something that you conceive or imagine insofar as its members will never know it, uh, all of its mem uh, all the members of the community. If you'd like to think about it in the following way, in a modern nationalist uh, world, you can convince a peasant from southern Italy that he needs to join the military and go and maybe even sacrifice his life to help his brothers in northern Italy who he never met and who he never encountered in many times would even see, uh, d uh, eat different foods and, and see different things uh, um, because they belong to one big nation. How this thing was uh, uh, created uh, in, in the eyes of Benedict Anderson, it starts from this community of readers that can suddenly have an image of a com uh, communion and fraternity and, com uh, and even uh, camaraderie without being in in close intimate um, connection, and this is very much connected to the big transitions that you see in the European world uh, after with um, um, in the wake, excuse me, of the Industrial Revolution, the old small intimate village in which everybody knows your name and you you and your family and your ancestors resided there in that locale for generations, you suddenly move to the mass urban center in which you are a small atom floating and suddenly the need to recreate the sense of intimacy and community emerges. Now, how does this famous theory of nationalism ties or maps onto our discussion? Um, some argued, and this is not my original uh, um, innovation, that actually if you take Benedict Anderson's ideas and read the origins of the modern Hebrew literature, you actually see something very similar. The Haskalah that we talked about earlier, and in particular the East European Haskalah literature, created what a very famous Israeli um, um, uh, literary critic and, and professor named Dan Meron called the first modern Jewish Respublica Literaria, which is the Republic of Letters. Suddenly you have a community that is based on writers, editors, but also readers. They don't necessarily inhabit the same places. They don't literally rub shoulders with each other, but they're reading the same novels and they're producing this kind of imagined communities. Suddenly in that environment, the novel offers a sense of a national community. And those who consume the novel, meaning the readers, also see that they're part of that start um, imagining themselves as part of that national community. And the authors closely identified with the printing press um, and the modern novel in that respect play a key role in, in uh, uh, creating, if you'd like, a sense of an imagined community. So he, you see here an example of the way in which scholars applied uh, Benedict Anderson's famous thesis 
onto the modern Jewish case in order to explain a key seminal moment in the rise of modern Jewish national sentiment and understanding. And again, to reminder, uh, uh, this is uh, uh, one possible interpretation. Now, we talked about the Haskalah um, and how exactly does Haskalah and the late Haskalah in the East European lands is connected to Zionism is one of the things that we will discuss in later parts of our class. In a way, the figure I've mentioned earlier, Yehuda Leib Gordon, can provide us one hint as to where this the transition went through. If you go back and revisit this famous proponent of the Haskalah, uh, only five years after writing the previous poem I've read, uh, he uh, Awake My People, he already started feeling that he, as the poet writing his poetry in Hebrew, might very well become the last of the Mohicans. That if Haskalah is so successful and the Jews of Russia will become more educated, will integrate in their whole society, pick up Russian, they will leave Hebrew behind. And suddenly he writes a very melancholic, sad poem called From Whom Do I Toil, in which he laments maybe I am the last of Zion's poets, and you are my last readers. He's writing this poem in Hebrew, so if you are able to read this poem in Hebrew in Russia of 1871, he says, maybe perhaps you, my friend, and me, the poet, we are the last of those Mohicans. See how wisely savvy move that uh, is happening here besides the mel melancholic tone is also the way he puts uh, uh, we are put together as part of that one community a communion uh, that the poet speaks to the reader and creates the fe feeling that we are part of that uh, imagined community after spending much time on, on the second concept uh, of Haskalah, let's move to the third concept of assimilation, which is, again, a very tricky and easily misunderstood and highly charged term. Now, crudely defined, assimilation is a sociological term that is describing a process in which a minority group or a minority culture uh, starts resembling the majority group in a given uh, society. Now, in a Jewish context, it's easily uh, equated with religious conversion of uh, that implies a wholesale or incorporation or conversion of foreign ideas of, or, or, and customs. And this is one of the reasons why uh, assimilation is a term Term that we need to be extremely careful uh, when using and applying and encountering it in the sources. Crudely speaking, if you look at the way that academics or sociologists are thinking about the term assimilation, you can uh, uh, distinguish between three different, if you'd like, models of an interaction between a minority group and a host society. One can be described as the teleological or the stage theory of assimilation, in which you assume that the contact between different groups, primarily when we're thinking about the interaction between immigrants and the majority society, begins with a, some sort of a hostile competition followed by accommodation and then ultimately results in intermarriage and amalgamation. If you'd like, uh, to put it in crude terms, the mathematical formula would be that A plus B plus C, with A meaning the host society, which is the majority, and then B and C are the uh, new minority society, the interaction between A plus B plus C equals A. Now, a second very different model is the one that is famously uh, referred to as the melting pot model. In the melting pot model, we think about different racial or ethnic groups that they come together, um, and out of the interaction comes a new culture that incorporates elements of from all of those groups into one. So if you'd like in mathematical formulas, here A plus B plus B plus C equals 
the a new phenomena and often especially in the american setting especially in light of a very famous play by the jewish uh, playwright israel zangwill that is called the melting pot america of the early 20th century loved using the melting pot not so much as a description of an accurate sociological process but as a kind of a wishful thinking that the american society is not simply the different immigrant communities the french and the italians and the irish each one keeping their own enclaves, but creation creation of a new American uh, national society, which is that D, which uh, has some elements of each. A third slightly different model, which is the one that was developed in later years and out of a critic criticisms of the melting pot model, is what we often uh, refer to as cultural pluralism, or if you'd like a metaphor, the salad bowl model. In this uh, model, you see different groups that each keeps its own unique cultural norms and traditions or behaviors, while still sharing some common national values, goals, and institutions. So again, if you'd like in a mathematical formula, here A plus B plus C equals A plus B plus C only while everyone agrees on some basic rules of the game and obeying the same rules and, and, and following the same institutions. This is a very nicely neat classical typology that sociologists will use and this is for those of you who will take sociology classes will be familiar with this discussion of what was called the Chicago School of Sociology, um, Milton Gordon's Assimilation in American Life, which was a very famous and influential book from the 1960s, uh, refers to that. I put it here on our table just to pay attention to the way in which um, sociologists refer to the term today, which is not necessarily the same way that our historical actors would use the same words. For instance, if you look at someone like Max Nordau, and we will read his famous address at the First Zionist Congress in August 1897. Well, sadly, Max Nordau was a highly educated man, but he could not read the works of the American sociologist from the 1960s. And when he was thinking assimilation, he had a very different uh, mindset in um, and, and a very different working definition of that a specific term. And we, I, I'll just... Uh, we will return to Max Noro in later discussions, but I will just uh, quote one sentence from his famous uh, speech address to the Zionist Congress in which he describes the division in world Jewry between East and West, and in, in which one sees that after the association and assimilation of the Western uh, Jews, uh, we see a sense of loss of meaning and identity. Uh, they do need their salvation. And at the same um, time, the Eastern European Jews were not emancipated, but they also, uh, by, by virtue of that, uh, did not uh, follow that misfortune that he calls assimilation. Uh, and for him, uh, no, though, assimilation was, in his words, true mimicry. Um, in which one of those ages when the Jews allowed to believe that he was just a German, just a French, just an Italian and so forth. And for him, assimilation is a very bad sociological process. So I put it here and, and I would like you to pay an attention because there is a very important tension that is something that historians struggle with all the time between the way we use words. On the one hand, we are using assimilation sometimes as scholars, as historians, sociologists, and so on, as an analytical term, having in mind the way in which scholars and sociologists define the very complicated process. But often you will encounter the word assimilation used in the primary sources by the historical actors themselves and especially in intra-Jewish debates uh, between 
pro-Western or pro Haskalah uh, uh, figures and their uh, rivals and opponents. And the opponents of Haskalah would often use the word assimilation to describe what they see as a problem about it, an empty imitation of values of the surrounding society and losing one's authentic quote-unquote identity. The nationalistic rejection of assimilation is also a key element here, um, and it played both ways. It was also an animating idea among some Zionists that saw assimilation as a problem. Uh, they are suddenly they are losing the Jews because they are assimilating into their hosting society. But it also played um, uh, uh, a double sword, uh, double-edged sword, kind of a, 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 a way into the language of the anti-Semitic uh, uh, um, um, uh, criticisms of the Jews that were seen as, cre uh, as, a, as a group that is not assimilating enough and creates an awful situation of a state within a state. They're not patriotic enough, they're not loyal, uh, and this was a classic way to question um, the uh, Jewish uh, loyalty by anti-Semitic uh, opponents of the Jewish assimilation. So you can see how the different meanings and uh, and uh, that were um, uh, ascribed to this very tricky word could play uh, 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 take us in very different directions. And my last comment, in a way, takes us to uh, uh, the last uh, concept I would like to put on the table, which is of course modern anti-Semitism and how all of this is connected to modern anti-Semitism and Romanticism. Now, I am posing here an unfair question because to answer it would require us an entire seminar. Uh, but scholars of European history would agree that one should distinguish modern forms of anti-Semitism from ancient forms of hatred of Jews. Now, in fact, if you look at the word anti-Semitism itself, it has a very clear date of birth, 1879. It was first coined by a German theologian named Wilhelm Ma, who led the fight to overturn the Jewish emancipation that we just talked about. And he published a very uh, notorious essay that was called The Way to Victory of Germanicism over Judaism, in which he started using this term, and after which even an anti-Semitic league was established. It was a very popular pamphlet. It reached um, 12 editions uh, by a, uh, uh, a very uh, by this in the same year that it was published. And 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 Marx's conception of anti-Semitism, um, unlike older type of uh, theologically based hatred of Jews, suppose that there's a racial uh, characteristic to the Jews. And this is a very important and key distinction, as uh, uh, because if there are racial characteristic of the Jews, uh, it means that uh, assimilation is actually something which uh, is a dangerous process that would uh, uh, that is a threat to the host society. Uh, and uh, 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 by and large, and this is a very different uh, um, uh, world than uh, theologically based dialogue in which the Jew might be seen as inferior, he can be even seen, God forbid, as the Antichrist, but he has a redemption, he has a way out through conversion um, to Christianity. So here you have a very different type of, uh, uh, of of conception of, of, of anti-Semitism. Uh, and again, his organization, the League of Antisemites, introduced the words anti-Semite uh, anti into the political lexicon and established this really uh, first uh, popular, wide uh, political movement that was really based entirely on anti uh, on this kind of uh, uh, anti-Jewish uh, 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 laws. So this is a key uh, landmark event in the road to a very racialized way of thinking about the Jews as opposed to older theologically based hatred which as I've mentioned could be overcome by conversion and this is why I would even put the word modern in parenthesis for uh, this is uh, uh, if anti-semitism is indeed a modern 
uh, phenomena, as I just mentioned, you do not need to uh, uh, to use uh, this qualification. The older forms of uh, anti-Jewish hostility, you could call them by a different uh, uh, by a different uh, name, um, um, theological Jewish hatred, and so on. Um, and this is unfortunately a very important distinction for the historian. But in our day and age, when these distinctions are weaponized and politicized, these thin hair splitting distinctions that we as historians pay much attention to are easily ignored and there's an image a popular image of jewish hatred as some of the world uh, oldest hatred as if it's one uh, stable and unchanging phenomena without paying uh, close attention to these differences uh, and here for the anti the modern anti-semite of mars stripe converted jews are actually the biggest dangers they are the still more untrust uh, untrusty worth and in fact they are even more dangerous because you can no longer distinguish them from their host society and therefore you have an impetus to uh, to create this modern pseudoscience of racism in order to find how these mimics revolting mimics are penetrating into the german nation masquerading um, as if they're they are jews uh, and no longer distinguishable from their host society if you are familiar with uh, the movie Ma uh, zelig by uh, that was directed by woody allen in the 1980s it's a mockumentary that made fun of the process of i just uh, uh, just described it is uh, a fantasy about a jew that behaves like a human chameleon you will put him ne next to native americans he will suddenly appear and will look like a native american you will put him next to uh, um, taller uh, people he will suddenly grow taller you will put him next to uh, irish um, immigrants and will suddenly start speaking in an Irish accent and this is of course a playful way to talk about the modern uh, hostility toward the Jews because there are these revolting mimics that uh, that uh, you cannot distinguish uh, them from their environment so Zalig, Zalig by Woody Allen captured humorously something that was explained philosophically by many people I uh, will take one example for the end of our class from Hélène Finkelkraut is a French essayist and a philosopher was born in 1949 to Polish a Jewish Polish manufacturer and fine leather good who was uh, deported to Auschwitz so he's a second generation Holocaust survivor and um, in a very famous uh, book uh, a collection of essays that was uh, entitled the imaginary Jew uh, le juif imaginaire uh, he wrote uh, the following passage that I think captures some of those ideas very well so I quote from Ellen Finkelkau anti-semitism turned racist only on the fateful day when as a consequence of Jewish emancipation you could no longer pick the Jews out of a crowd at first glance since the Jews those revolting mimics were no longer distinguishable by any particular trait they were graced with distinct mentality Science was charged with succeeding uh, where the gaze had failed, asked to make sure that the adv adversary remained foreign, to stigmatize the national of Israel by enclosing it within Jewish reality. Racial hatred and its blind rage were essentially the Jews' punishment for no longer placing their difference in display. End of quote. So, Pinkelkraut put it in so many in in in, in so many words in in and and summarize some of those ideas much better than I could do. Uh, like many other thinkers, Finkelkraut seemed to have an answer to the question: How we distinguish old Jewish hatred from modern anti-Semitism? Racial science emphasized the difference and unassimilability. Uh, and the otherness of the Jew, that even when the Jew will pick up the language of his neighbor, start dressing like, like him, even eating like him, following his customs and norms, he still has something different in his quote-unquote blood. And this is a modern way of thinking. Modernity bling, brings with it this rhetoric of blood 
and race that changes it, uh, the form of the hatred accordingly. And the Jews are no longer persecuted, therefore, as the Antichrists, the murderers of Jesus on theological ground, um, but due to their uh, 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 "Quote unquote racial traits." Um, if you've no, noticed uh, a, a pro-Zionist undertone in in Finkelkraut's uh, readings, I'm not sure you are entirely in, incorrect. Um, um, he definitely uh, uh, was a supporter of Zionism, but his reading is also a very, if you'd like, French reading. And in the next classes, we will return to Flans. To France, or more accurately, to Paris in the late 19th century, torn during the famous Dreyfus affair, um, um, in which uh, that culminated in January 1895, where uh, when uh, Captain Alfred Dreyfus, a Jewish officer in the French military, was accused of treason and betraying secrets to the arch enemy, the Prussians. Um, and this is a famous affair, both because it brought to the forefront how a, a nation that was seen as civilized and enlightened as the France is suddenly uh, swept with anti-Semitic uh, uh, sentiment. And also because a young, um, um, a young journalist, reporter by the name of Theodor Herzl was sent there by his uh, German newspaper the Neue Freie Presse to uh, report about these events uh, and he was a witness. Um, historians later on debated whether that was his moment of insight in, that pushed him to develop the Zionist movement, yes or no, and we will talk about it in later classes. But we will, before we will do so, in our next uh, meeting, we will discuss Herzl's pre uh, uh, precursors or forerunners. And we will actually ask ourselves, were there actually, so to speak, forerunners for Zionism? That is, people who expressed ideas that we will call Zionists before even uh, Herzl uh, step on the stage, created the Zionist organizations, and even before the term Zionism itself was coined. So these are the questions that will animate our ne the next discussion. Thank you for listening. Until we meet again, stay well and happy reading.